over to John Lindsay, who um, regularly attends um, these seminars and uh, enlightens us, or attempts to anyway, um, <laughs> with uh, thoughts. Um, Alan Turing's apple, um, I think it's towards the history of data science, is that roughly right? Well, my cover's really been blown. I'd intended not to talk at all about what the talk topic of the meeting was, okay. because on that basis only the people who were at the last meeting would know what I was talking about. And the problem is that the sub-editing of the programme has now put data science into the headline, so my cover's blown. <laughs> my second cover's blown, but when I sent Keith the email with the summary of the meeting, and when I built the Facebook page, I put Turing's death as 1953. So where I got that from, I don't know. But either there's always a lesson there to check your facts, because it was 1954, or alternatively I deliberately put mistakes into things <laughs> in order that I can find out whether people are plagiarising and or not paying any attention. But the, the core of the matter came out of an event at the British Library, where there is now a thing called the Alan Turing Institute, and it is the Institute for Data Science. So I went and inquired, and the responses I got was, it's got nothing to do with the British Library, we're only renting space here. Now, two things occurred to me from that. The one was, how is it that Alan Turing has reached the status that he's at? And secondly, what on earth is this thing called data science? Where's it come from and where's it going to? And a lot of things are all happening at the same time. The National Portrait Gallery has just published a volume, Speak Its Name, with two pages on Alan Turing, in which he is quoted out of the 2012 edition of Andrew Hodge's book, Turing believes machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. Now, for 1952, that was actually, I think, quite brave of Turing, and I'll come back to that at the end. What I have to check, though, is whether Andrew Hodges had that in the first edition of his book, because what there might have been is some rewriting into intervening 40 years. There's a more elementary question of whether Alan Turing would ever have been recovered were it not for Andrew Hodge's book. And I think that is unknowable because we can't rerun the, the, the tape of history. What's probably less well known is that Andrew Hodges wrote a pamphlet with downcast gaze, which he has now digitised himself and put on the internet. And that gives much more of a flavour of what the early days of the Gay Liberation Front were about. And I'll come back to that one later on. But the nut that I want to crack open, I've put on the far poster over there. And I recognize that even in a small meeting like this, some people might be information scientists, some people might be gay liberationists, and some people might be uh, socialists, and some people might be any and all combinations of those. But I'm starting with what seems to be the nut that I want to crack. Because when in 1958 the Institution of Information Scientists was formed, which is the same year as the British Computer Society, there was something going on. And from, and I'm too young to know that because I was still a schoolboy at the time, uh, difficult though it would be to work that out looking at me now. The, Information scientists, I can't work out from their early literature whether they saw themselves as being information practitioners who were using their tools to crack problems of science, whether they thought, saw themselves as scientists who were using the tools of information to crack the problems of science, or whether they were something completely new that didn't previously exist calling themselves information scientists because they were dealing with problems that hadn't previously existed. The second poster starts with 1916 and, and the trick, the reason for doing these things on posters 
is that you can reorganize the matrix according to how you want to put it up. And I start there with 1916, because that's what was then the Library Association, formed the thing that became the British Humanities Index. And the reason I wanted to do a seminar in a place like this is because if the information scientists were concerned with science, then what was happening to the humanities and the arts? Did it mean that the tools of the scientists were going to be applied somehow or other to the practices of the humanities? And if they were to be, then how were you to know whether they were working or not? The second date I have down there is 1924, when an organisation was formed called, called ASLIP, which was the Association of Scientific Libraries and Information Bureaus. So now the word bureau is being used with the word information, and the word libraries is being used. So what I want to investigate is in what sense were the tools of librarianship, which had been practised for 3,000 years, had those tools achieved any degree of stability or normative acceptability that somehow or other they were no longer appropriate to the problems of 1958. And so I've put 1958 as the next date down there because the British Computer Society started producing a journal. And in the same way as ASLIP started off its proceedings, with some fairly high-sounding ethical statements about the public good rather than the private right. In 1958, the British Computer Society did the same sort of thing. And so the question of whether the tools of librarianship were somehow or other superseded by the tools of information science, if we knew what those were, then allows us to say, is this new institution of data science going to invent something completely new because it's dealing with something that has never existed before? Or is it simply going to replicate all the mistakes that have been made by information science if we know what they are? And or has it taken on board the learned tools of information science if we knew what those were? And or do we still have the tools of librarianship at the heart of what it is we're really on about, if we knew what those were? And as you move down, we have that we are here in the Institute of Historical Research. So we have another institute. We have a concept of institution. And the concept of institution then developed for itself a concept called information, sorry, not even called institution theory. And some 60 years after somebody else had produced a concept called information theory. So information theory needs to be slotted into 1948 in my time slide, and it then has to have attached to it a pair of writers called Shannon and Weaver who produced a concept called information theory, which was the complete negation of information. What they were talking about was how a message passed from a sender to a recipient, and that message was completely free of any concept of information. So if information, and when I tracked the history of information, I went back to, 18, to 1386, because that was the first date I found it being recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary, and it was perfectly clear in 1386 what the word information meant. It, it appears again in Elizabeth the First Book of Common Prayer, and again it's perfectly clear what it means. So why Shannon and Weaver turned it inside out and destroyed its meaning is an answer to which the question doesn't even appear to have been addressed in any of the literature I've looked at so far. So the institution matter then became more provocative because of a bloke called Danto, who produced a theory which he called Art World. And so in the institutional theory of Art World, he produces a body of knowledge. But unfortunately, he doesn't put any meat into it. As we move down the slide, we have the word historical. And so that, in some sense or other, becomes the absolute fulcrum of what we're talking about in the Institute of Historical Research.
And this is where, again, I, I came back to wanting to do a meeting here because the Institution of Historical Research and indeed the literature of historical research seems never really to have considered the matters and the methods which are generated out of the practices of librarianship and information science. There, there is a very thin literature, but I'm happy to be shot down by somebody who can point me to a section of the whole of the universe of discourse where there is a document which I haven't found. The research, of course, is something which can apply to absolutely everything and immediately raises the question of how does it tie into practice and how does your practice or your research help you to decide what is positive and negative, what is right and wrong, what is true and false, if you want to live in a binary world. And I tagged onto there then this particular group which is concerned with socialists and socialism and historians. But in the same way as I can't tell whether information science is science applied to information, information applied to science, or something completely new that didn't exist before, I can't tell whether the socialists are historians or the historians are socialists. In fact, a lot of the historical method research literature I read tells me that according to historians, you can't be a socialist historian because that destroys the purpose and value of being a historian. Uh, in the days of postmodernist stress, whether anybody accepts any of those ideas or not anymore gets me to a problem and a matter which I'm going to come to in a moment or two. The next slide I put up in order to put some meat into this is the socialist historians. So I put a page over there with the headline at the top, uh, socialist historians. And I'm going to pick on a couple of meetings which some people here have been at because that validates it with the practice of the people who have been at this meeting and therefore know the story of the events that I'm recounting. One was an event called, I'm not sure it was called 1956 and all that, but it was about 1956 and all that. And interestingly, the speaker didn't mention the Socialist Historian's Journal at all and didn't mention John Savile's 1956 account in the meeting on 1956 and all that. And in the question time, I challenged him that he had to deal with not only 1956, for example, in the context of Africa, with the stories of the South African Communist Party, the story of the Cold War, what the British Communist Party was doing, what the Americans were doing, what the Russians were doing, and so on and so forth. But he had to deal also with the stories of what the women were doing in the anti-apartheid movement. And I suggested that actually the women's story had to be in a double helix with the story of the African National Congress, of course, which had been around for much longer than the South African Communist Party and the various stories and the South African situation becomes more complicated of course because by the time Cuba is engaged in Angola the whole of the military struggle has produced an entirely new type of politics that lasts, uh, probably it's still lasting. Mm -hmm. So the story that he was telling seemed to me to have the first enumeration of what I'm going to end up calling Alan Turing's apple that when he provided a narrative, and his narrative went on for probably the same amount of time as my narrative is going to go on for, I can't tell whether he was, he was constructing history to fit his narrative, whether he was leaving stuff out because it didn't fit his narrative. In other words, he was lying or denying, or he didn't, simply didn't know some stuff or actually I'm deluded and the stuff is not there. And this story I'm going to come back to again. And there was another meeting that people were at where somebody talked about municipal dreams. Now I found that a really interesting meeting because there was so little in the literature about urban history and the construction of urban realities rather than nation state realities. And he left out of his narrative about high-rise developments, anything to do with transport. And I pointed this out in, the quest in question time, and he said I was quite right. And I brought along a little diagram to show the complexity 
of how we try to model what might be seen as architectural history and the shape and form of urban design. And I'm going to point to another little moment here because in several of the other seminars that I, that I pop into from time to time, it's difficult to work out whether people know anything about how London came into being after 1965 because the post-65 London is very different from the pre-65 London. It's very difficult to work out whether the radicalism that appeared in the membership of Malga in the 1970s was really because the shape of the London counties had been changed. They had to take on new obligations that they hadn't had to deal with previously. And from the construction of the housing estates, now the housing estates start in the 1880s, but they have a story that runs through right until now. And I think it's a question which we might want to come back to about whether it was the reorganisation of local government that led to the reconstruction of the ideas of the people working in local government. And so, for example, in Hammersmith, what was the National Association of Local Government Officers had a staff newsletter uh, called The Anvil. And when, they, when Malgo became a national trade union by joining the TUC, and Hammersmith and Fulham were joined together into a new local authority, they turned that into the Malgo Bulletin called The Hammer. And so The Anvil became The Hammer. The really difficult problem is finding any of this Nalgo material at all. And that gets us down to the difficulties of the way in which the archives were built up over quite a long period of time. And I've met this problem again now in another story, which I won't have time to go on to tonight. The next page I put up was to say, well, in this time frame that I built over there, there has to be a my story as well, because inevitably I've been engaged in these sorts of practices. And my experiences uh, start off with my undergraduate module studies, where I did a module called Scientific Documentation. I did a module called Political Science. I did several modules called Political Science. And I couldn't for the life of me work out how on earth to make political science work with scientific documentation. And I couldn't work out how to make scientific documentation work with political science. And it was round about that time that I had my first experience of computers. And I can remember working out that with a Hollerith card, because you had nine down one side and you had 80 across the top, you could actually cut a little square and you could glue a microfilm into the little square and then you could use the 40 by 9 matrix to do your indexing. And that meant you could do real document retrieval with microfilm. That meant you had to carry the tray of cards across to where the computer was. I didn't see any possibility of public engagement with this at that stage. And it didn't stop me tripping over a curb and dropping the whole tray of cards onto the, on, on, onto the road. Uh, and those are the sort of practicalities. My story, I would need to fill in as we move through all these different events in order to work out what of my experiences fit into the story I said of, of Alan Turing Lapple, that I'm simply delu deluded that what I thought happened didn't happen at all, that my narratives are just fitting my narrative and that I'm leaving out everything that everybody else around the table wants to hear, that I'm in denial or lying about whether events happened or not or whether my story makes a certain amount of, of sense. So in order to put some meat into what happened with the information scientists, I started on the table which I've inserted on the small sheet into the dateline. And it starts on, in 2008, because a bloke called Alan Gilchrist, who apologised for not being here tonight because he's too old to travel and he doesn't trust other railways, uh, produced a volume of the Journal of Information Science. And the volume was then uh, written by crowdsourcing a group of people with their accounts of what happened from 1958, when the institution was founded, to 1979, when the journal started, to 2008, when this 50th anniversary uh, volume was produced. And <coughs> I found some of their stories really quite extraordinary. 
but I've actually known most of them for quite a long time. The journal is available on Sage, and so I don't demonstrate these things during discussions and meetings because by the time I've typed in or fiddled and farted around with the, with the cursor and what have you, I've completely lost the thread of what I want to cover, which is why I do these little notes. The difference is that Sage has the whole of the Journal of Information Science now online, fully digitized. And so you can search on Sage, but all you've got is a search bar. So what on earth do you put into that search bar? And the Journal of Information Science is not available here. It's not on public open shelf access in the British Library. So you've got to know where you can find it if you're going to do anything with the paper version of it, and or you have to have a subscription and be in an institution which has a subscription in order to have an electronic access to the journal. So the fact that you can search the journal is fantastically useful, provided you've got some idea of what to search for. Now, earlier than the Journal of Information Science was another journal called the Journal of Documentation. And this has a rather longer history. The Journal of Documentation has been fully digitized and is available through another group of, of, of practice called Emerald. And Emerald has several others. And again, the Journal of Documentation is not in the Institute of Historical Research. So you don't have access to the paper versions of it. Uh, the public uh, available is not available unless, again, you have a subscription. And you can then search but you, all you can see in both cases is, is the first two or three lines of the article. So you can't even tell how your search term has been of any significance. And the Journal of Documentation 2 is not available in the British Library on open access. And the way, I don't want to bore people to tears with how to manipulate the British Library, but you want to know how to fill a ridiculous form in, and you're then not allowed to order any more than six volumes in a particular event of practice. So you could spend an awful lot of time trying to find any of these things. The, what is on the open shelf in the British Library is a thing called DECA, which is the Encyclopedia of Librarianship and Information Science. It runs to 73 volumes. So you might take a while climbing through it, and it's in alphabetical order. So the index is in alphabetical order. So you aren't really much helped in how to do any of this. There, there is also a, a thing uh, uh, called a yearbook, and there are, that stopped in 2002. So for the period that I'm thinking is significant, it covers the whole period. There's also a thing called Trek, which people have to be tiny little detailed bit of specialists to know about. But Trek is fully available on the internet. So provided you know Trek exists, there's a lot of material in there. And that's what got me for the first time. This comes into my story again. Because this is what first got me into saying, sorry, there's something going on here which you haven't got your heads around. And this starts for me in my story round about 1985. And I would then need to add 1985 and my story to the matrix of dates and to the my story date because it was by that time I was principal lecturer at Kingston in information systems. So into the whole thread of stories there about information science, I have to add the extra quadrant of information systems, because to what extent were we inventing something new? To what extent were we simply dragging and dropping old stories? And there was a socialist story in this, because a bloke called Stafford Beer was one of the advisors to Allende. And after the catastrophe of Allende, Stafford Beer didn't take any blame at all for having possibly provided the wrong sort of systems stories. And I then came across this in more detail because I worked later on with a bloke called Ronaldo Ramirez. And so we had quite a lot of conversations about who knew anything about Stafford Beer, who knew anything about systems theory, and by now, who knows anything about, about Allende. So there's a whole bunch of history there which will have to be written up at some point or other. But the danger of those sorts of stories is they then take me away from my central thread 
which was that I had learned. And my simple friend reminds me, I forgot to bring my main audiovisual aid with me. It's still sitting next to the sink, which was the spine of an ox coming out of an oxtail soup. So we have the big bit of the vertebrae at the top, and we have the tiny little bits of the vertebrae at the bottom. And I, would, I use this idea of spine in order to keep my mind on track to make sure that if people interrupt, not I'm, I'm always how happy to be interrupted if people I quite often dish out little red cards and green cards and yellow cards that people can put on posters if they want to come in at some point or other. Uh, so I'm happy to be interrupted because in my mind I have a spine. And so the, the ox bone is a little metaphor of the spine because the my story by 85 is I had realized that actually we were not only building databases, and we'd known, I'd known about databases since 75, because I'd been able to log on to Eric uh, in uh, Lockheed Dialogue, and I'd been able to do a search on Eric, which showed me that I could do something as a consequence of the computer, which I'd never done before. And that was the consequence of the way in which the librarianship had used the database tool in order to build a new tool. And all that was dealing with was the record as the record had been constructed because of the international standards which had been described to construct records. As soon as I realized in 1985 what was happening with networking databases, I said to myself, actually, there is something quite profoundly new coming on here. And I, I had a contract from UNESCO uh, which then resulted in a report called Databases and Networking for International Development. Uh, and that's somewhere or other in, in UNESCO. But the networking of databases was what got me to the first meeting in Europe of what became the Internet Engineering Task Force. And it was at one of those meetings that I first met Tim Berners-Lee and his idea of what was hypertext in his idea of what was, what was a hypertext market language. And I said to him that unless we sort out the information retrieval problems, we're going to have a nightmare. And he said, if we don't get it out there, we won't have a chance to have a nightmare. And I agreed with him on that. And it begat the nightmare that we now have. The difference is that he's now St. Timothy Tibbles. And so the idea that what happened with the internet was the destruction of the semantics of the collection means that when you now do, and when, the, the, this gets me back to why I wrote in the Allende story, because of course two people who hatched up out of the Allende experience was a local Winograd and a local Flores, and it was Winograd who then adopted the protocol that became Google, whereas I would have said this is complete nonsense, but that's one which now one simply has to leave and live beyond. So my story of the internet got me to say, actually, what we need to go back to is the idea of controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, and classification schemes, because that's the only way of maintaining order and ritual out of being able to find anything. In the meantime, something else has been happening, because rather than simply having computerized and digitized the record, we're now beginning to digitize the whole file. So what we now have are these no longer records digitized, but now the entire document digitized. So the point I made earlier on uh, journal information science now applies not just to a journal like the Journal of Information Science, but it applies to journals in huge collections like JSTOR. And so you then get to the stage of saying what we now have are what we're going to have to call, call social media. And the term I got out of social media was this whole idea, and Tim will remember what it is because I can't read my handwriting from here. Which one? It, it's, it, it's the one that starts off with social media on the big one. <coughs> Cognitive and, science. That's right, there we are. There we are. Cognitive bubbles. Yes, that's right. And so we then have the idea of crowdsourcing, of tag clouds, of hashtagery, and that then becomes a Wikipedia matter because Wikipedia has what I call notability. And so the problem is that unless you're inside three relevant academic journals, 
which of course you can't find because you don't have the capability to do search on them, you can't get a paragraph into Wikipedia. But Wikipedia inevitably remains the starting point for any relatively interesting beginning point of trying to deal with something. And I'll move to two cases and then sum up on a little bit of detail. The first case is that journal in the far corner there, uh, the Journal of the Levy Studies, because the first article, if you could read out the title of the first article, and William Allen, Divine Justice and Cosmic Order and Early Greek Epic. Yes, big words those. And of course, what he's on about is the story of the judgment of Paris. And he's there on about was Paris right to nick heaven? Was Helen right to be nicked by Paris? And of course, what that story leaves out, and almost all the stories uh, of the judgment of Paris, leave out the bit of the conversation between Zeus and Eris, which sent Eris off to the Hesperides to go to the wedding to throw the apple into the wedding, which leads to the consequence of the three graces or the three charities or the three goddesses. And you've got to go back to 1880 in order to get the story as Jen Harrison tells it in, again, a very early issue of that journal. And she's got the bit about the fact that it's Zeus saying the world is overpopulated, we have to wipe out these people who then gets Eris to go to the Hesperides. The Hesperides are the evening sunset. The golden apple is the glowing golden orb of the setting sun. In order to get the apple, to take the apple, to give it to Paris, who's been forced to go there. And in Jane Harrison does a wonderful job of capturing all the, go- all the, all the early pots showing the story. Never you do you see these three naked goddesses. Because the obvious question that ought to be asked of that author and 2060 still alive, under what circumstances, if you have justice and a cosmic order, do you have three naked women parading in front of a couple of blokes? Now, by 2006, he ought to have learned about sexism. He ought to have learned something out of the previous 50 years. But those people move very slowly, because on the back of the journal, it remarks that in 2006, they want you to send in your articles on a floppy disk. So floppy disk 2006, the Hellenic Society hasn't quite got it yet. The other story I was going to mention is a uh, article in the 20th century uh, British History Journal, uh, which has as its important abstract, and I've written them down there so I can stand up and read them. The first major organization in the British labour movement and the British left to advance policy on gay rights from the gay liberation movement neglected by scholars. Now, we could open up a competition on who thinks that organisation might have been. And for that scholar, the organisation is the Communist Party of Great Britain. Now, I've heard the story told before as a meeting of the archives and uh, libraries and museums people in, 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 London, in London Met. So somebody's got a story there to tell. So as a bit of countervailing evidence, I brought her along a book which has only just been published, in which a collection of people talk about uh, the founding of Rock Against Racism and it leading to the Anti-Nazi League Carnival in Victoria Park. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further than that. I still can't talk about that without absolutely tearing up. So I'm going to jump from there to the people doing the uh, um, archives, libraries, and, and museum stuff. And say, so actually, when we try and join together, and, and they call, I call it qualms, uh, because they've coined this LGBTQI, etc., to which they put a plus at the end. And of course, the plus doesn't mean anything, because for years, we've used an asterisk to mean the right truncation of a screen. And of course, the asterisk has a wonderful little joke about it, 
in terms of why it's it shaped the way it is and why it's called an asterisk, which we could come along to on another occasion, rather like our rights of passage. So the work on trying to find out what we've learned in information science librarianship takes me through those documents. And I found a thing which I didn't know about called Audacious. Audacious was launched in the 1960s and the intention was to use machine processing to apply the UDC category set with machine sorting and machine searching. It disappeared without trace and I reinvented that idea in the 1980s which I did in a more simple form. I would then bring in to the areas which I don't want to bore the non-information people with, but to say that actually what we have is a thing called citation indexing, and that I think is a particular body of knowledge which might not have been in, in librarianship, but it might have been, as we have the British Humanities Index from 1916, now it's centenary, they've never used any of these tools at all. <coughs> we have Garside producing permuta, and out of that, a thing called the Arts and Humanities Citation Index, which is still running and produces about five volumes a year now. At one level, I would say it doesn't work in the humanities, and I would say the electronic form doesn't work. But somebody could produce a counter-argument and say, actually, it's better than anything else we've got so far. The problem again is, it's in the British Library, it's on the open shelves, almost no one else anywhere is likely to have access to it unless they're extremely well funded. And I think I would probably uh, say that the consequence of the mass digitization means that we possibly do have a new phenomenon that has never previously existed. And therefore we need to invent a new word called data science to deal with how we work with this new phenomenon that has never existed before. We might say that actually what we need to do is to rescue what we did learn over the 60 years of information science. We need to rescue what we have learned in the last 3,000 years of librarianship and at the very least put those tools to the test over what are now these new connections. And I go back to a very simple starting point in that journal article, for example, where if you look at the way the footnotes the references and the bibliography have been organised. If you go to any text, you can't find out from the bibliography, the references and the footnotes where the modern authors are actually referenced. That you've then got to read the whole bloody thing again when you realise you want to find something that you couldn't find before. So I came up with a very simple thing, this is going to go to my, my story again, which I call the Bible Index which is simply to join together the occurrence of the citation, the bibliography, the reference, and the moment in the text, and build those into a table. I then built a very simple table form that I called steps, which was simply to say that we have space. So what we need are controlled vocabularies that go into necessary and sufficient detail in order to identify the place names and their associations. We map those against time, and our time can be as crude or as elementary or as detailed as we need it to be. This is called the tree warrant. We then have events, we have people, and we have sources. And those tables can then be sorted in any way you like, according to how you need them. And that seems to lead me to my last two points. The first is that I would have been set up a while ago to be antagonistic to data science and in support, be in support of something else. But I think I've learned that actually we don't need binaries. It, it, it's a sort of John Berger didn't write this book, Berger word thing. That actually the consequence of things being framed in shapes like all the shapes that I put on the table is that our thoughts are framed into these sorts of shapes. And so there's a huge literature that says that people are binary in the way in which they think and the way in which they do things. And I think we can just change that and say, no, we can actually be trinities. We've had trinitarians around at least since the time of Freud, if not from the time of Jesus Christ. So rather than setting science against the arts, as C.S. Lewis did, we can say this is simply going to be design, science, and art. <laughs>
and we can now have a trinity. And it's a little diagram on one of these sheets where I've shown the notations I use. Because when you are having trinities or multiplexities of what we in the trade call faceted classification, you can simply use numbers in order to change the order sequence that they go on. And the second point that I'm ending with is that it seems to me that when the information scientists produce this idea of relevance, which is on one of those sheets again, the idea of relevance had attached to it a concept called recall. And in the early days of Honoris card sorted databases, you could see the working of that in terms of what was quick quark, you could see the working of that. But as we began to inter-network databases, I said this isn't going to work anymore and we need a different way of approaching it. And the relevance and recall didn't ever have attached to it a set of concepts called precision and accuracy. And that's what I said we needed. And I then said we have a huge literature on perception and sensation. And so if we go back to my little mistake over there about 1953, did anybody get really irritated that I put 53 rather than 54? Or the fact that I called it Alan Turning's apple? Did anybody get really irritated that I called it Turning and not Turing? Because if you get irritated about something in history, that's actually a sensation. It's a sensation which is a consequence of perception. And therefore what you need is a sense of proportion about your sensations and your perceptions if you're going to have relevance and recall with precision and accuracy as you work across this new universe. Now, whether those things happen or not, of course, is completely out with any of my control. But as the events emerge at the Alan Turing Institute, I think we can go back to say that actually, <coughs> when Alan Turing either committed suicide or had an accident, and there's now a vast literature because of a film, uh, that, and because of Andrew Rogers' book, that the literature from the psychologist to the psychiatrists is all about him being depressed. But actually, the reason he put the apple there might have been because he was telling a completely different story entirely. And that his story of Eris through to the Hesperides, through to Paris and Helen and Zeus, is was in fact a courageous statement about how much the world had to change. And the fact that we can do this now, if, <laughs> again, he did change, he achieved something. So I'll stop there.